All right, all right. Good morning. Look at the person sitting beside you and say, I'm glad you're here today. Go on and tell them, I'm glad you are here today. Look back at them and say, cool, where are we going to go to eat after this? What are you going to pay for? You're going to take me out to eat, right? And we're going to have a little fun here. Well, man, it's so good to see you guys. And thank you so much for coming and worshiping with us. And maybe you're at our, our Grayson location. Guys, we love you guys that are in Carter County, there at Boyd or Ashland location. God is doing a great thing in this region. We are one church in three locations. We're so, so thankful to have such an awesome, incredible team there in, in Ashland and in Grayson leading the way with your pastors. I'm telling you, it's just amazing to see what God is doing right there in this region. So if you have your Bibles, go to me to Luke chapter 14. Uh, we're continuing with this series, Walk This Way. Before we do this, you, you heard already that Clayton King is coming next week. Clayton is a great friend. We've known each other for the last 20 years, and uh, he loves to come into Kentucky, and usually when he comes, man, he brings the heat, and just lives are being changed. He's one of the greatest evangelists I've ever met in my entire life. I think there's now over 300,000 people has come to faith in Christ through his ministry and preaching. And if you know anybody or any friend or your spouse or your child or a, a family member, or a coach, a teacher that you just want to, to bring, I'm telling you, next Sunday would be an awesome Sunday for you to bring them because I know they're gonna hear the gospel and the life-changing message. So you don't wanna miss next Sunday at all of our locations. It's going to be great. Okay, so here we are, Luke chapter 14. We've been walking through this for the last several weeks. And... Um, I've really just been just walking this out with the Lord in my own life over this past summer and, and, and going through this one specific passage and how the Lord has really been using it in my life. And, and I wanna be able to share that with you as well. And so we're, we're getting out to the end of this section in this passage, and that's what we're gonna focus on today. But let's just recap, walk through this together in Luke chapter 14, starting in verse 25. It says, a large crowd was following Jesus and he turned around and he said it to them. Now, remember, we talked about this. Who's in the crowd? So many people's in the crowd. So many people are just coming after Jesus. We have people who are skeptics. We have people who, who are doubting. We have people who are there just for the blessings. We have fake people. We have real converts who follow after Jesus. So the crowd, there's so many people. And what I said was, there's so many people today here in the crowd. Some of you, you're just asking questions, you're just seeking, you're searching. Some of you are really committed to the things of God. Some of you are fake. And, and, and the reason I say it, because the Bible tells us that. what the Bible says, examine our heart to make sure we're truly in the faith. But Jesus has a way of vetting the crowds out. It's like, hey, yeah, 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 come here, come here, come here, come here. And in life, you know, uh, salvation is free. It's a gift to you. Come. And then once you come into the faith, he says, okay, now you're ready for the hard stuff. Hey, he has a way of saying, are you here just for the miracles and the meals, or are you here to follow after me? And so Jesus has a way of vetting and clearing out the crowd. And so he says this in verse 26. If you want to be my disciple. Now, again, if is a condition. It's a choice. No one can force you, no one can make you, no one can bribe you. It's your choice, you have to choose. This is your choice. If you, you means you all, y'all can say y'all, this is like Southern Hebrew here, like Southern Jerusalem, like Greek, y'all. Like If y'all, is what I would say, if you all, anybody in the crowd, no matter what your background, your past, where you come from, what you said, what you tried, what you've done, doesn't matter if anything that you've happened in your life, does not matter. If you truly wanna be my disciple, now, they saw Jesus as a rabbi. A rabbi calls the disciples, their pupils, their learners to follow after them. So Jesus says, if you wanna be my learner, you wanna be my disciple, you really wanna mimic me, you wanna be like me, become me, become like me, there's some things you gotta do. And he says this, you must, by comparison, hate everyone else. Ouch. Man, what about all these miracles and meals and like salvation and eternal life and... You gotta hate your mother, your father, your wife, your children, your brothers, sisters, yes, even your own life. And he says for the very first time, otherwise you cannot be my disciple. Now we know Jesus is not saying hate your family. We know that, right? That contradicts what scripture, and scripture don't contradict itself. So what is this statement? So how, how would we receive that? It means to love less. In comparison, it's to love less, that your love for me should be so supreme that you love all your other relationships less than me. Do you supremely, supremely love me? He says, if not, you can't be my disciple. Man, 
It goes on to verse 27, it says, and if you do not carry your own cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. So second time, he says, you cannot be my disciple, you cannot be my disciple. He says, you've gotta pick up your cross or take up your cross, carry your cross and follow after me. Now, we talked about this. A lot of people think cross means burden. Well, this is the burden you gotta carry. This is just the, 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 the hand that life dealt you and you just gotta bear, you just gotta bear these burdens. But that's not what the cross meant. The cross meant death, it means dying. And so what is Jesus saying? Here's what he's saying. Every single day of your life, you're gonna compete against yourself. And you're gonna want things in your life and you're gonna want to be selfish because you think it's all about you. So here's what's gonna happen. Every day I want you to die to yourself and surrender completely to me. I want you to die to your dreams, your purpose, your plans, what you think, how you can run your life, you can be the CEO of your life. Like you, you think you've got all this figured out, but if you, if you well, die to yourself, here's what happens. The Bible says, now you'll be raised in life with me. Which means this, all your dreams now will be resurrected dreams, will be resurrected purpose, will be resurrected life. And the life I have for you and plan for you, if you learn to just die to yourself and trust me, just trust me with your life, just trust me with the plans, just trust me with your purpose. If you'll just follow after me and trust me, I will take you on this unbelievable journey for the rest of your life, if you'll just follow after me. Do you trust me? So you have to die to yourself, deny yourself in one of the passages it says. And then look what he says, follow me. Which means to come after me. So not only to say, okay, Jesus is about you, but now I'm gonna come after you, I'm gonna pursue you, I'm gonna follow after you. Or he says, you cannot be my disciple. And he says in verse 28, but don't begin until you count the cost. See, nobody really talks about this part, right? I mean, nobody really talks about the cost of following Jesus. Like, what is it gonna, what, what's gonna cost you? It could cost you your friends. It could cost you, like for me, about 90% of my vocabulary when I gave my life to Jesus, my music that I listened to a lot of times, the things I used to watch and look at. Like, like some people didn't wanna hang out with me anymore. You be made fun of now because you're a Christian. And that's just minimal stuff. Like, count the cost. People today are losing their life right now today for preaching the gospel. Like, have you count the cost? If you really wanna come, it's gonna cost you. Every decision, remember we said this, every decision in your life will cost you something, every decision. You choose to work overtime, it's gonna cost you family time. You may have to do that for a season. I'm not saying you can't do that. I'm not saying that's even bad, but you gotta understand, to do that costs you something. It's gonna cost you something. Every decision, you're gonna be in every extracurricular activity, it's gonna cost you something. It's not that that's a bad thing, you just have to make sure you understand the cost and is it willing for the cost because it will cost. Every decision you make in your life costs you something. Have you counted that cost? For who would begin construction of a building without first calculating the cost to see if there's enough money to finish it? Otherwise, you might complete only the foundation before running out of money and then everyone will laugh at you, ridicule you, make fun of you. They would say, there's the person who started that building and could not afford to finish. There's the person who says they follow after Jesus, but they don't live like it. I think one of the most damaging things to the church is when people say they're Christians, but they don't live like it. Yeah, they come on Sunday and wave their hanky, but then they cuss out their employee on Monday. And so you, you claim to be a Christian, but you don't act like a Christian. But I do on Sunday around my family, but not throughout the week. So what happened? You didn't really count the cost because you still think it's about you and you want to walk in your flesh. And now people ridicule you, make fun of you, or say, look at you, or you're a hypocrite. Why would I even want your God, or why would I even go to your church, or why would I wanna be who you say you serve? So if we really count the cost, I'm willing to surrender my everything, my, my words, my thoughts, my life, my lifestyle, everything to him, my relationships, my job, my business, my investment, everything I am, I'm gonna surrender everything to him. Have you really counted that cost? to really see what it means to follow after Jesus. If not, those who start but really don't finish will be ridiculed, be made fun of. Verse 31, or what king would go to war against another king without first sitting down with his counselor to discuss whether his army of 10,000 could beat the 20,000 soldiers marching to get him, against him. Remember we talked about this, there's a war room taking place, all the generals come in and say, guys, what's our strategy? Well, we've got 10,000, they have 20,000. They're two times bigger than us. Okay, how we fix this? How do we win this? Well, sir, we can fight to our death and we can try our best to see if we can win, but if we do, we know the ultimate outcome. Everyone in our entire city will be utterly destroyed. They will take over the land and all our possessions that we have will be theirs. Or 
verse 32, if we can't, he will he send out a delegation to discuss the terms of peace while the enemy is still far away? So hey, I got another idea. Why don't we just say, listen, we can't win this battle, so let's surrender. And if we surrender, we get to keep our land, we get to keep our houses, we get, yes, they'll be deeded to them, they'll own all of our assets in our kingdom, but we still be with our family, our wives, our children, our livestock, and we can continue living under the rule. So let's send a delegate out of peace and say, hey, hey, let's, let's come to a peace agreement. We'll completely surrender to you. And then Jesus wants to ask us the question, have we completely surrendered to him? Because the reality is your kingdom cannot stand up against his kingdom. His kingdom is coming and is moving. And you can fight, you can run, but someday you will surrender. Someday the Bible says every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. No matter who you are, where you come from, whatever religion you say, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. And, and on this side of eternity right now, that's why we're begging you, do that before it's too late. Because someday you will. This is a losing battle. You cannot win against his kingdom. Why don't you just go ahead and surrender? Lord, everything I have is yours. I'm going to surrender. You've, and here's the reality. He's already made the peace agreement. He sent himself. He came and died in your place. He already has the peace treaty. You can now have peace with God, not because you did something, because he came to us. And now, no matter who you are in the crowd, skeptical, believer, or, or non-believer, or doubter, or whatever, you can have peace with God through Jesus Christ. All you have to do is surrender. Surrender to him. And then he makes this incredible statement that kind of rocks everybody, and probably still rocks you as the last two weeks we talked about this. The third, you cannot become. Look what he says. You cannot become my disciple. Love me supremely, die to yourself daily, oh watch this, without giving up everything you own. Literally means to renounce all your possessions, to give up all your possessions, or you can't be my disciple. Now I wish, I, I wish we had some video cameras back then, right? I wish I could saw how many people in there said, Yo, Johnny, dude, I didn't sign up for this one, man. Like, no, dog, I ain't going down this road, man. Like, I, I'm not going this route. Like, there's no way I'm going to, like, tell my mama, my daddy that I hate them. I, I'm not going to, like, like, take up a cross. I don't want to die under the Romans' hands here. And, and now I got to give up everything? Man, peace, man. Thanks for the meals and the miracles, but I'm out. Like, how many people in the crowd left? Like, Jesus had a way of weeding out the crowd. Like, how many really just left? I wish, you know, we could see that. And, and take a glimpse at But I wonder if they responded the same way that maybe we respond today. I mean, that's hard. To love him before everybody else? Man, how do you do that? To die to yourself when really I'm here to take care of myself and be the best of me that I could be and it's all about me, but how do I die to myself and I've got dreams and hopes and goals and plans and, but they're God's dreams and hopes and goals and plans? How, how does that even work? And, I mean, I don't have a lot, but give what I have, and, or I have a lot, how do I give that? But don't miss it, he didn't say you gotta give it all away. He said you gotta give it up, which means to be emotionally disconnected. Let me, let me say this, there's nothing wrong with possessions. Some of you have a little, some of you have a lot. There's nothing wrong with possessions. The problem is, is when the possessions possess you. And when they control you and you find your trust in your possessions, when you find your worth in your possessions, when you find your security in your possession, it has become your king, it has become your idol. Jesus says it's become your God. And God is a jealous God in the first commandment, thou shall not be, no gods be for me. And we might think of a God like or a goddess or, or something out there. No, 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 no. What you worship is your God. Some of you worship your status. Some of you worship your net worth. Some of you worship your degree. Some of you worship your, who you are. No, no, yourself. Whatever you worship is your God. So here's what we're gonna do, and we talked about this. If you remember, he said, listen, he didn't say you have to give it all away, but you need to surrender your total kingdom to me. And he says this, if you'll seek my kingdom first, everything you worry about in your own kingdom, how you gonna put food on the table, how you gonna pay the bills, how you gonna make sure your kid gets through college, how all this is gonna work out. If you'll just seek my kingdom, watch this, 
I will take care of your kingdom. You don't have to worry about tomorrow. So who is on the throne of your life? Just going through those, recapping that, who's really sitting on the throne? If you could peel back your heart, who's a picture of the king on your, on your throne? And to be honest with you, a lot of times, it's me. It's you. I want what I want, when I want. I wanna run my life. I think I understand. I think have some common sense and make the best decision I can. But God's like, wait, 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 wait. I wanna be the king. See, that's the problem as Christians. We want the kingdom and all the benefits, the meals, the miracles, and how God provides, and eternal life, and all this great stuff, but we don't want the king. And Jesus says, no, if you just trust me with your life, love me supremely, complete, complete loyal to me, like completely surrender to me, I'm telling you what, your life will be abundant blessing to all the people around you if you'll just trust me. And here's the reality, and let's just be honest with all of us, right? I'm preaching to myself. Here's the reality. We don't fully trust him. We say it. This is easy to preach. Boy, it's hard to live. So what do we do? How, how, how do we handle that? And then last week we talked about, but if it's all his and he leaves it in my pocket, what do I do with it? Like, if you just wake up every day and go, everything I have his, everything I have, my, my home, my business, my life, my retirement, my kids, my finances, everything, everything, my whole kingdom, that's my kingdom, my little kingdom, it's all his. I've surrendered it to him, but he allows me to manage it. And last week we talked about how to manage well, right? How to make right investments, how to save your money properly, how to spend it wisely, how to pay back debt. Like, the Bible is full about how to win with your possessions and not let them possess you. Because there's nothing wrong with the money. It's all neutral. It's not good or evil. It's the pursuit or the love or the security of it that allows us to get emotionally attached. And that's why he says you have to kiss it goodbye. Emotionally detach yourself from your possessions. Now, just hearing that, <laughs> you think maybe Jesus is kind of like slow down, right? Okay, is there any like good news here? Like, is there any benefits now? Like, what's, what's in it for me? Like, is there anything? And so Jesus goes through like dying to yourself and it's complete surrender to me and he moves right into the kitchen. Like, they think about this. I, I, I want you to picture this. Take up your cross and follow me. Now, to us or to them, that was, okay, Roman crucifixion. Hate your family. Well, that goes against the most worst, like, honor code on the planet. You love your family. High honor. Surrender your kingdom and all your possessions. And then look what he says at verse 34. Salt's good. <laughs> like, what, what do you, like, now we're in a cooking class? Now Jesus is like a chef? Like, like, like what, what is this? Like, come on, could you imagine, like, people, like, some of the guys were like, the zealots were like, that's right, we're gonna die with Jesus, and, and we surrendered all, and, and Peter's like, we've left it all for him, that's right, and you should leave it all too, and I mean, you got a few ameners, like, maybe like two in this whole crowd, and now there's by this time, half of them more is left, and Jesus like, boy, I don't know about you, but salt's good, can I get a witness? I mean, look at it, isn't like, this hilarious? I mean, isn't this like, I mean, some people are like, do you even read, like, if you read your Bible, like, this is so funny. Like, salt is good for seasoning, and some are like, mm, amen, Bible, I'm getting hungry now, Jesus, and so like, man, we heard about all this like stuff, you gotta like, hate your family, like, but let's get some like chicken up in here, right? Let, let's get some like good food, can you like whip up something? Like, could you make some meal, like, cause, that, cause you're, you're making me hungry, man, Talk about salt. Salt is good for season. And then look, it says, but if it loses its flavor, how do you make salty, salt again, or salty again? How do you make it salty again? Now, notice that Jesus didn't answer the question. Because it's a given. You can't make salty or salt salty again. You can't do that. So he, he assumes you already get this. And look what he says. Flavorless salt is good neither for the soul or for the manure pile. Like, could you imagine sitting listening this like, you know, scratching your head, like, where does he go with this? Like, what, why, why does he end this whole entire little section that we've been going through for several weeks with salt? Flavorless salt is good for nothing or for the, or not even for the manure pile. It's thrown away, and, and then he makes this comment, anyone who has ears or anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand or act immediately 
on whether you want to choose to follow me or not. So what is Jesus, how do we end this, and how does, I'm in this passage right here with salt is good for seeing, like how, how do we get this? Well, here's what we know, real salt, compound chemically wise, cannot lose its saltiness. Pure salt can't lose its saltiness. But there's something in here that, unless we really dive into historical context and stuff, we just don't really pick up on. They received their salt from the Dead Sea. In fact, if you go to the Dead Sea today, the salt is so thick in the Dead Sea that you can actually float on top of the water because the thickness of the salt, you can't sink. You'll float on it because it's so much salt in it. That's why they call it the Dead Sea, by the way, because there's nothing like living in it because salt kills. And they would go get salt from the Dead Sea. And in the Dead Sea, in the midst of the salts, are these crystals. And these crystals look identical to salt. In fact, when you sort it, you can't tell the difference between is that the mineral or is that actually salt? And so they keep it mixed together. And so if we were living in the first century and Jesus said this, we would already have an understanding of the Dead Sea and the crystals that are mixed, that some is good and some is not. And this is not really flavorable, so this type of salt is really worthless. And so you have to just throw it out or they would throw it in manure piles because a lot of times they make these clay. They made the first Kamado Joes, you know what I'm talking about? The first big green egg. Of course, it was a brown egg. You know, they take this manure and they would make these ovens and they would put the manure on the floor to it harden and they would throw salt when they thought the fire because it made it burn more and faster. I know it's disgusting, but it was like the, you know, brown egg, I guess you call it, right? And, and so that's what they would cook on. You can go and research it. It's pretty fascinating. And they would use it but then it would just burn out. So it was basically like, it's worthless. So this type of salt that has these crystals mixed in it, it's got to toss it. It's really no good. So how, how does this end? Where do we go from here with salt? And so what Jesus is trying to say, true disciples are salty. A true disciple is salty and can never lose their salt. In fact, it's salty people that change the world, and not the salty that you think about, like how maybe you got away to the church this morning because the kids were late, or you haven't made plans where you're gonna eat yet, and you got a little salty. But the reality is Jesus has called us to be salty 2,000 years ago. If we're gonna truly be his disciple, we must be salty. Look what it says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. Jesus makes this. In the Sermon on the Mount, he makes this statement. You are the salt of the earth. What's that mean? But what good is salt if it loses its flavor? Can you make it salted again? No, that's the answer. That's why I don't answer it, because it's a given. You can't. Pure compound salt cannot be salty again. It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot. Watch this, because it's worthless. So now you have real salt, but then you have fake salt, but they look the same, but they taste different. They taste different. This has no taste. It's tasteless, but this Salvary is season. So if you're gonna be my disciple, be the real thing, not the fake thing. Be real salt, be salty, because you're the salt of the earth. In fact, I've left you as the salt in this manure pile, in this toxic, downhill moral world to be the salt of it if you really wanna be my disciple. What, what does that mean? How does that work? Well, if we look through the scripture, there's a lot of things about salt. I'm just gonna mention a few real quick. Salt was a, a picture of a binding covenant in Leviticus. They used salt to bind a covenant. It was for healing and cleansing. If you cut yourself, they would pour salt. It could heal, it could clean. When a baby was born, they wrapped it in salt to, to cleanse it. It's a stimulant for appetite. We see through the scripture, it prevents decay. They put salt to keep things from decaying. It was a promoter of peace. It stimulates our testimony right here according to Matthew 5, 13. There's something about salt that, if I'm the salt of the earth, what does that look like? How did it be salty? And then it's the evidence of God's grace in my life. When I was preparing for this, I researched, and there's over 14,000 uses for salt. 14,000 uses, that's crazy. Like 14,000 different type of uses for salt. But what would a salt meant to them? You gotta put this in context. So you're sitting here and you're like, okay, check one, Hey, my family, check two. Okay, surrender my possessions, check three. Die to myself, all right, and now be salty. Can't be fake salt, can't be this crystal. I gotta be the real thing. And if I really am the real thing, I'll never lose it because real pure salt can never lose its saltiness. 
is that a true, genuine believer will never lose their salvation. They will be true, true to the end. How do you know? Because they're true. They're not fake. They don't fall away. So what does this look like to us today? And there's some few things that came to my mind and I just sort of wrote this down. They're not on the screen, but I'm just gonna give them to you pretty quick at all of our locations. First of all, salt is distinctive. You can always tell the difference. It's unique. They knew that, but listen, salt was a high commodity. It was very valuable. This was actually a compliment at this time. This was a very valuable mineral that was traded. And he goes, you're so valuable. Listen to me, my disciples. You're valuable. You're unique. You're distinctive. There's something different about you. Don't be like the Dead Sea mixed with crystals where you can't tell the difference. And remember we said about this, today in our own world, a lot of times you can't tell the difference between people who say they're Christians and those who don't. So if we're gonna be salt, we have to be different. We have to be distinctive. We have to be unique. Another thing about salt, salt flavors. And give you high cholesterol, but that's another sermon. We'll get to that later. But salt flavors. You know this, right? You grab some vegetables, you grab something, and you're like, hey, something's missing. Could you, say it with me, could you pass the salt? Why? Because just a sprinkle, just a little bit flavors it. Mm, I'm preaching now, right? I mean, it flavors it like, I mean, it's good. Just a little bit. Don't eat a lot. Just a little bit flavors it. And the same way as a true follower of Jesus, we are to be, watch this, we are to be this flavor of seasoning this toxic world that we live in, that everywhere we go, it seasons just a little bit of flavor. It's just a little bit better. You've heard me say this for the last 15 years of being your pastor here, that when we, our generation moves on or of or dies off and the next generation coming, if we were to leave, could we leave this place a little bit better? Could our cities be a little bit better because of the salt of believers who were in the city. That, that's, that's the reality. Your days are numbered. My days are numbered. And we have a short time to pass this off and influence the next generation so that, watch this, when they come up, that we can leave this just a little bit better. I tell students this all the time. Can your high school or middle school be just a little bit better because you're, can you change it all? Probably not. But could you make a little different? Can you make a little impact? See, it just takes a little bit of salt to season it, to make it flavorable. Here's something else, salt creates thirst. They know that, you know that. It ain't them salty ham, Woo, Man, you be drinking water for days. Love salty ham. I mean, like my mouth right now is slobbing right now. You're just thinking about it, right? That's the OCD in me, you just gotta hang tight. Right, like, I mean, the salty ham. When's the last time in your own life have you made someone thirst for Christ? Tomorrow at work when people are around you, they they can taste, they can see the flavor, something's different. Her love, her genuine, her patient, her tone, his body language, his demeanor, his passion and compassion. Man, why are you so different? I kind of want what you have. What do you have? What's the secret? Give me the secret sauce. Like, what difference? Have you, are, you cra- are, are people thirsting for righteous? I mean, thirst is all through the scripture, right? Those who are thirsty come. Those who want come. And we see this all through the scripture. The woman at the well, give me some of that water so that I never have to thirst again. Like, this is making me thirsty. Where can I get this? When's the last time we could said about us that people look at our life and go, man, I want what you have. And I'm not talking about your possession. I'm talking about your attitude, your, your demeanor. Like there's some or there's something different. It's flavorable or something different. And it's just, in this toxic workplace we live in, but you shine. What is it? But for most of us, I wonder, can people really see Jesus in us? The reality, that's how my roommate in college wanted me to Christ. I tell people all the time, he literally loved the hell out of me. Because for two years I watched and I was thirsty. How can he have just as much fun as me, yet follow Jesus? How can he say no to, to his convictions, but still hang out with me? 
and it was his lifestyle. In fact, the night that I gave my life to Jesus, here's what I prayed, God, I want whatever he has. Can that be said about me? Can that be said about you at school, in the workplace, in your cubicle, on the court, off the court, in the locker room, at the games? Can people look at you and go, man, I want what you have, man. What is it? How do I get in on this? You really wanna be my disciple? You better count the cost. You can't mingle. Yeah, you're in the world. I've left you in the world, but you're to be distinctive. You're to be different than the world. I believe that's one of the biggest problems with the church today, at least in the western part of the world in America, we're so much like the world and mingle with it, they can't tell the difference. Salt preserves. Salt slows down the decaying process. Salt slows down the rotten, moral, spiritual decline in our world. And maybe one reason he told us to be salt is we're to preserve the things of God. You're the salt, so preserve it. All this toxic and decay is gonna do everything. You're to preserve it. God always has a remnant, a handful of people. You're to preserve the truth as salt would preserve. And then salt penetrates. It penetrates. I got a smoker and so I try to make a, a, a Boston butt. I don't know why they call it butt when it's really the shoulder. Some of you just learned that for the very first time. I know how to Google it, but anyway. And so I like, how do I smoke this? How do I, how do I learn to smoke this? And I'm amazed of what salt, and you read that every single one is salt, 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 salt. I'm like, man, it's gonna be salty, like, like salt. Like why was there something about it when it comes to this, how it penetrates? And I'm thinking, if we're the salt, how do we penetrate our workplace? our schools, our cities, our locker rooms, our malls, our shopping centers, anywhere you go, how do you penetrate the culture where God has placed us at this time to make a difference? How do, we, how do we do that? We're to be the salt of the earth. In fact, Colossians 4, 6, look what it says. Let your conversations be always full of grace, seasoned with salt so that you may know how to answer everyone. Like even the words we say are to be seasoned. Just a little bit, just a little bit. Because too much salt, come on, right? I know you've probably have been to the restaurant and some jokes or pranks are in front of you, thought they had you and they unscrew the top off the salt lid just a little bit before, right? And you take it out and you think you're gonna put a little bit and See, sometimes we just pour a bunch of salt on people who don't even know who Jesus is, and we just pour salt and burn them. No, we're to season it, just sprinkle it, flavor and thirst. Like, what's so different about you that every word that comes in our mouth is clothed with grace? Could you imagine? Could you imagine what that will look like? I read this. Um, I read this studying for this. This guy named Robert Bella. He's the Department of Sociology Chair at California Berkeley. Huge in sociology. He studies human behavior and all this stuff all the time. And, and, and here's, here's a statement he made. This is, this is what he said. The quality of a culture may be changed when 2% of its people have a new vision. I want you to think about that. He says this, it only takes 2% of a group of people who have a new vision to change a culture based on all of his study of human interaction as a sociologist, 2%. Now, if that is true, we don't know 100% of that to be true because that's a lot if you think about it. 2% is more than what you think. If 2% could catch it, it could transform a culture. One of the smartest minds studying sociology. And so last night I sat down and I said, that was interesting. So I started looking at Rowan County and Carter County and Boyd County total population. And what hit me was, if that is true, in Rowan County, listen to me here at Moorhead, it would take 490 salty people 
to change the entire culture of Round County, if that is true. 490 people who are sold out, committed, fully surrendered, fully loyal, fully in love with Jesus, salt of the earth, penetrates it, season it. I will be everything you've called me to do. If 500 people, 500 people out of 25,000 just give me 500 in the whole entire community. They'll be sold out for Jesus. We could change the entire county. Is that fascinating? If that is true, 2%. Then I dropped, jumped into Carter County. Listen to me, Grayson. Listen to me. Listen to me. 490. 490 people in Carter County get salty. I'm gonna do whatever it takes to follow Jesus completely loyal, completely surrendered, completely faithful to him. I'm gonna die to myself. I trust him in every area of my life. If 490 people in Carter County, according to the, some of the brightest minds, you can change the whole entire county. Don't seem like much, does it? And then Boyd County, I jumped into Boyd County in Ashland. 47,000 plus people. It takes 950. 950 salty people who are sold out for Jesus and says, you know what, I'm all in. I've got this new vision. I'm gonna be the salt of the earth. I'm gonna be a fully disciple. I'm not gonna be a fake. You're gonna be tell the difference between the crystal. I'm not gonna lose my flavor. 950 people can change all of Boyd County. And when you start looking at this, you're like a couple thousand people out of 100,000 people spread across three counties. Man, we can do this. God has positioned our church to be this, the salt and light of the earth. I can't make you, I can't force you. Jesus is not gonna make you and Jesus is not gonna force you. That's why he turns to the crowd and says, if, if, and if you decide to get serious about really following Jesus and be the disciple that he has called you to be, hold on. We can leave this region sprinkling salt just a little bit better than the way we found it. A disciple is someone who has submitted their entire life to Christ and lives in obedience to his word. And if we would just get in his word and be obedient to his word, the Bible is the only book on the planet that breathes. When you open it up, it opens you up. When you read it, it reads you. It's the only book on the planet that breathes because it's living and it's active. And a true disciple, a true disciple has completely submitted their life to Christ and they obey God's word. And with that, listen, we can change the region. It's a challenge. Count the cost, but you can do it. I'm gonna ask if you would to bow your heads. John Calvin said this, I gave up all for Christ, but what have I found? I want you to hear that. He said, I gave it all up for Christ, but what have I found? And here's what he said, I have found everything in him. I gave it all up, but what have I found? And he says, I have found everything in Christ. And that is so, so true. And so if you're here this morning and you've never surrendered your life to Jesus, man, at any of our locations, let's go. Today's the day to repent of your sin. You've heard the cost, a clear demonstration and presentation of the cause. And Jesus says, if you'll confess me with your mouth that I am Lord and believe in your heart that God raised me from the dead, if you'll believe that, he says, then you'll be saved. And today, I can't save you. You can't earn it, you can't pay for it, you can't, can't work for it, it's free. 
Would you receive it? And if that's you right now, you could cry out to the Lord and say, Jesus, I believe. I believe you came for me. I believe you died for me. And I believe you got up out of the grave for me. And today I repent of my sin. I put all my faith in you. Now help me follow you all the days of my life. If that's you and you truly made a heart connection with Jesus, the Bible says that you have been saved. And just in a moment, one of your pastors or hosts is gonna come out and they're gonna share with you your next steps or what your next step is in following Jesus. For some of you, you're still considering this. It's okay. You keep coming back. You keep seeking. You keep searching. You keep asking. For some of us who are followers of Jesus, what would it take to be the 2%? Sold out, fully committed, salt of the earth, salt of Round County, salt of Carter County, salt of Boyd County. We could change a region. Just a couple thousand people out of 100,000 people. Father, thank you so much for your word. So relevant. Same challenge to the first century Jews, the same challenge to us today to count the cost. And Jesus, thank you for paying the ultimate cost. That you gave your life for us. And even yet, while we were still sinners, far from you, rejecting you, you died for us. The Holy Spirit, help us, empower us to be the Talmudines, to be the disciples that you have called us to be, that we will be the salt that never loses its flavor of this earth until you come back to get your church, your people to be with you. For it's your name we ask and we pray. Come on out, everybody say it. Amen.